to a new edition of the Hit Treat Podcast. Today it's going to be an amazing episode because I have my dear friend, Mark Johnston. Mark Johnston, all the way from Michigan. How's it going, Mark? It is going excellent, Carlos. A little cold up here today, a little snow last night, but uh, we're getting by. It's typical Michigan weather. It's, uh, I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you because, as well, you're a personal friend. Uh, we used to hang out a bunch before these travel restrictions uh, to work on many projects together. Today we're gonna have a, we're gonna talk about retrofitting, retrofits, big retrofits projects. So for the ones that don't know, uh, Mar has been working uh, on the foreign industry uh, with AFC Whole Crop uh, on retrofits. But I'm talking huge retrofits, uh, uh, seven, eight pusher uh, pusher lines uh, being retrofit. Uh, Mark is gonna tell us a little bit about what he does what to do, what not to do with retrofitting equipment and the nature of this business. So Mark, can you uh, introduce, your, uh, in, introduce us to, uh, the re fir first, uh, we want to know a little about yourself, Mark. You've been in this industry for a lot of time, but what actually when I saw your uh, CV, you have a fine arts degree. How, how, how did you end up retrofitting furnaces? Well, Back in my high school days, I took a lot of uh, uh, engineering drafting classes and uh, along with a lot of art classes. And then when I went to, went, to, went to college, I went for an art degree. And once I got my degree, I went to look for a job. And there really wasn't a lot of high paying jobs in the art field just starting out. So I... Uh, decided to look into the drafting aspect of it. And there, there was a, a, a job shop that was hiring. So I went and uh, started at, at a job shop doing uh, detailing of, of um, glass factories. Okay. And then uh, I got to know some of the guys that were working there and one of the guys left and went over to AFC. And he's, he got over there and he gave me a call one day, says, hey, AFC is looking for some uh, draftsmen over here. You want to come on over? So back in the days, AFC was called Atmosphere Furnace Company, right? Atmosphere, Atmosphere Furnace Company, correct. Right. Which year are we talking about? I'm sorry? Which, which, which was the year? That was uh, late 70s, early 80s. Late 70s, early 80s. Okay. So I went over to AFC, Atmosphere Furnace Company, and uh, worked for them for many years until there was a, a slowdown in 1981, 82, where I got laid off. And then I went over to Pacific Industrial Furnace Company. They had a, a, a large uh, contract, government contract uh, for a huge line out in California. And they were looking for some engineering assistance on that. So I contracted myself in for the summer at PIFCO, Pacific Industrial Furnace Company. And then when that was done, Luckily, uh, AFC was back in business again, and they uh, called me back, and I went back to AFC Holcroft. I mean, to AFC Furnace Company. Then, um, in the interim, PIFCO call, kept calling me back, saying, "Well, we want to offer you a permanent job with us." Which we went around and around for about six months, and then finally, uh, they, they came up with a, with a nice figure for me to make the move. So I went over to PIFCO. PIFCO ended up, I stayed there until uh, 96 when AFC purchased PIFCO Then went over back. Be, be, be because of you, because they, they wanted you back, right? Apparently, so, yes. So, so they, had to, they had to purchase an entire company just to get you back, right? Well, that's, it, was, it, was a, it was a steep cost, but, but they got me finally. So I went back there, and then, uh, as you know, 2000, AFC, AFC uh, Holcroft was formed. And so... Then uh, back, back, pretty much where I started in heat treat at the Atmosphere Furnace Company in Wixom there. Yeah, and, and, and ever since, so you started back in, in the late 70s on the heat treat industry, right? Yes. Right, and, and uh, your position is quite uh, interesting because uh, you have been uh, on the engineering side, also on the sales side, but your passion is retrofits. Yes. Right? Uh, wh what is, uh, how, how is it different selling a brand new furnace? Uh, because I know you have, uh, 
versus selling a retrofit uh, project? Well, with, with, when I was with Pacific Industrial Furnace, I did, I spent five years on the road doing retrofits, doing installs, doing commissionings, doing operator training, startups. So that's, that's really where I got my education as far as, as far as the rebuild portion of it and the you were, you, you, you were a field engineer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so so I, that exposure to the field uh, gets you a bunch of experience really quick. Yes, because out in the field, you have to learn and, 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 and come up with answers on the fly. And you're dealing with the customers on a daily basis too. And they're, you know, they're wanting to know what's going on with the equipment. You know, why isn't it running? You know, when's this, when's this going to be run? So you got to think outside the box a lot when you're out in the field. And so you spent uh, your early career doing all field work, right? You went back to AFC and then that's when you started on, on sales or retrofits, you say? Well, I, after I got done with, uh, with the field, I went and did uh, project management for AFC. Project management, but uh, now specifically talking about retrofits and going back to, to my question. Uh, Why are there so many uh, retrofits on, on this industry? We know that a furnace is a self-destructive machine. If, if we have a furnace running parts, you know, atmosphere, uh, we get a lot of soot, we got a lot of, of, of uh, uh, you know, fumes, uh, a lot of mechanical friction, uh, expansion uh, from, from the heat. So if you don't maintain the, the furnace, the furnace is going to collapse. Right? Uh, right, with time. There are companies who, which do, which do an amazing job on maintenance. There are companies who uh, might need to improve their maintenance factor. But how it's a retrofit different from a regular maintenance? Regular maintenance is, is more of, of a yearly or bi-yearly event that, you know, that their maintenance guys, the plant maintenance guys can handle on their own. It's, you know, replacing radiant YouTubes, replacing burners, changing out fans, changing out alloy components in there. That's, 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 that's the maintenance contract. That's, that's pretty straightforward as far as once they understand the equipment and, you know, we can provide, we, we provide AF, AFC whole crop field supervision to help them When, if it's a brand new customer with, with the maintenance aspect of it, they can hire our services to come out, show them how to do it or assist them in how to do it. Now, retrofit is a completely different beast. That's, that's bringing a, an older furnace up to current NFPA standards and insurance standards, making it uh, uh, more efficiently operation, operational. There's, uh, there's furnaces which, have, uh, which are like 50 years old. But they have been well maintained and retrofitted, and they're they're actually running. But uh, the key is to keep upgrading uh, the the main components, like uh, uh, let, let's say uh, mechanics, controllers, and, uh, and and combustion systems. Will that be accurate, or, or I'm missing something? No, pretty pretty spot on with that. Yes, yes. Yeah, because. because The controls are that's that's a, that's a constant uh, upgrade that that uh, with 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 the new safety standards and, and NFPA standards. There's those are always there's always something that needs to be addressed on a retrofit. Okay, just just for the for just to clarify, can you tell the audience what NFPA is and why is it important? It's the uh, National Fire Protection Agency. It's it's the standard uh, that they use for furnace designs. So when, when we say, okay, this is NFPA compliant, I mean, there might be a very old furnace, but you, you're, not sure, you're not sure that the furnace has, have all, uh, has all the safety interlocks and, and, the, uh, and the safety guidelines in order not to blow up, right? Sure. So when, when uh, a guy like Mark gets a retrofit project, he, he needs to make sure that after the retrofit is done, the furnace comply with NFPA. And that requires a level of expertise, right? Correct, it does, yes. Now, uh, what is the common conception when you're retrofitting something uh, and, and the, the customer says, hey, you, we, we just need a little uh, here and a little there and uh, we can save a bunch of money. But you, you, you have to put in a lot of engineering time in there just to, to uh, figure out if, if it's compliant or not it's compliant with FPA. Do you get that a lot? Oh, yes, yes. 
a lot. There are a lot of customers out there that just want to put a band aid on on a sure. retrofit, and that, but there are customers that understand the importance of getting the equipment updated. You know, the control systems. So it, it's uh, it's 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 just up to the customer what they want. You know, but usually when I address a retrofit with a customer, I always state that you know the the furnace. If it isn't up to current safety standards, should be brought up current safety uh, safety standards. And let's go one step uh, behind and go like, uh, when is better to go for the retrofit, and when is better to say, dude, your furnace is 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 useless anymore. You should buy brand new. How how do you balance that? Because you work for a furnace company, right? Uh, right. And they they want to sell furnaces, but right. there's some time. That's my logic, right? Yes. But sometimes you got to say like, uh, well, you got this piece of equipment. Uh, is worth investing so much money in order to uh, save uh, buying a brand new unit, right? So what can you tell us about that? It depends on the size of, of the heat treat department. If, if they got a large heat, heat treat department, it's, it's, more, it's probably more advantageous for them to do a, a rebuild retrofit of that equipment providing it's in decent enough shape. It hasn't been totally destroyed throughout the years of operation. But if it's a smaller department, I, I would probably recommend, if it's that old of, a, old of equipment, I would, I would recommend probably a replacement of the equipment on a smaller department. How, what do you mean with a smaller department? Well, depending on, like, you know, if you got a, a batch line, so you got oh, a batch line. Okay, so depending on the size of the equipment. Yeah, yeah. If you got if you got a couple batch furnaces, you know that that need to be replaced, you know, versus a, a whole pusher line or, or multi pusher lines, you know that the multi pusher lines would probably be more more of a uh, better option for a retrofit and or an upgrade. So, how was the conversation with the customer when you saying like to buy brand new? The the, the furnaces are not. Uh, functional anymore because I believe every guy actually wants to uh, get use of everything that's there and when you tell a customer that the, the furnace is not functional anymore it's just a piece of scrap and we see many heat treat shops with furnaces that they're down that they're missing a lot of components and that they get all by the day and, and we see that happening with uh, let's be companies as well right And let's say they have like seven or eight batch furnaces, right? But they're they're run they're only running four. And the furnace is functional, but as time passes, they go like, "Hey, I need a switch. I need a probe. I you know I, I need a motor, right?" And after one year, it's way more expensive to uh, put all the spurs back in in, in that furnace. I I believe you see that a lot, don't you? Yes, yes, you do see yeah. that. Uh, they, they cannibalize off of Cannibalize, water. cannibalize. They cannibalize, correct. That's, that's the right. term. Is, that's, is that the right term? That is the right term, yes. Re remember that we're living in an era that uh, some things might not be politically correct. So yeah. we, we, you have to, we have to find another term. Okay, they that. borrow. Okay, they about, borrow. They, they borrow. borrow pieces borrow. from one furnace and put it on the other. How about that? Then? Yeah, that's fantastic. But that happens a lot. It and does. that's... Uh, That's a super bad, bad idea if you think long term uh, to maintain a line because you get a useful furnace, you turn it into a piece of crap. Yeah, but then what happens is if the customer's production demands go up, then they need that other furnaces, the other furnace or furnaces that they've removed those parts from. Then they're, they have to scramble and try to get those parts replaced and get, a, get them installed and get the, the uh, equipment back up and operational again. So what would you advise to those guys that do this? And, they, and, and I understand the logic because they want to save money and say, if I have a furnace and I need a flow meter or need a PLC or something, I don't have to buy one brand new. I mean, I just got to grab the one that is not working with, uh, I, I have a, an idle furnace in here, right? Correct. What would be your advice to those guys? It's all, it's all based on production demands. You know, they, they have, you know, they have a forecast down the road, how far, you know, how much, how much production they're, they got to push through, through that plant. They know, you know, how many furnaces it's going to take. So that's, that's up to them. Basically, I, I can't give them advice on that, but if, if they are, you know, 
removing components from one furnace to keep the other operational, I would say that they would need to definitely restock their spare parts so that when that time comes, when they need to get that furnace back up, up and operational again, they have those spare parts on the shelf and they can, uh, you know, their maintenance department can install them where they can hire us to come in and do it. Well, being a little more realistic, uh, the, the, the rules by the book tell us that we need to have spares on the shelf, right? But nobody likes to have spares because they cost money, right? Yeah. And yeah. they're very hard to keep track of, right? Right. And this is what I do with, with the foreign semi charger. So whenever they tell me, hey, we got to take this, this PLC from this furnace or this HMI, the furnace is, is not functional. I mean, it's, it's not operational, but it's functional. But we, we have to, uh, we have to uh, take this apart and install it on the, another, furnace, another furnace that is functional. I tell the guys, that's fine. But if that is a, a critical component part, uh, bring me the PO for the new element, right? Just to restock it. And, and, and use the other one. I'll give you authorization just to take the PLC out or the pump out or the, or the, you know, the gearbox out, but you have to place the order for the next one because maybe in six or eight months, uh, you're gonna have a peak of production. And, if you, uh, and those parts uh, might take uh, uh, eight to 10 weeks to get, right. you, like a gearbox. Is, is that something that you see in, in your field? Do they want a gearbox by tomorrow? Well, I, I don't handle the spare parts. You know, we have our spare parts department that handles that. There, there are a lot of uh, expedited orders through through uh, through our company spare parts. Yes, sometimes we can't get the exact we can, we can retrofit with the, uh, like other or other manufacturers gearbox that they'll do the same trick and just to get them up and operational. So what would you say that are the most uh, critical parts in a retrofit? The ones that take the most time to, uh, to purchase and deliver? Well, definitely the alloy. That, that, alloy? That's a big ticket item and recirculation fans, pump, pumps, gearboxes. Okay, so those are the things that they have to be uh, purchased uh, on, the, on the early stages on the project in order to have those parts when you're finally retrofitting the equipment, right? Yes. Okay, well, now let's switch to another very uh, interesting topic, which, which is insulation, right? Uh, which is a, a very big part of the retrofit. Uh, there's furnaces, and we're talking a little bit more on, on, on the carburizing side. I mean, furnaces with atmosphere, right? Uh, when, when they tell you to, to if, if the insulation is uh, functional or is it not functional? But it's not brand new. But has seven, so, some some time. How, how do you how do you know if you have to replace uh, uh, insulation? It depends on the age of the equipment, how how okay. long that insulation has been inside that furnace, the process, the carbon potential that they run inside the furnace. Um, visual inspection actually is is the easiest way to tell the condition of of the refractory inside the furnace. If it's if there's missing uh, pyro block components or cracks in the wall, stress cracks, expansion cracks, then you know that uh, it's time to, uh, to, to do a complete tear out and, and uh, re-brick it. And, and do, you, do you have to brick it 100% or you can par par partially do some, some walls or, or, or uh, well, the, the ceiling is a little more difficult because if you've got pyro blocks, uh, it's, it's better just to tear them out, but like on walls or floors, well, yeah, well, you, well, you can patch. You can patch that. You know, just keep it operational. If you're just looking for a quick turnaround time on there. But if we're talking about a retrofit, will you recommend just just tear everything apart and install brand new? I mean, if, that's how I would recommend it. Yes. Yeah. If 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 you you know if you if you want the equipment up and operational for an extended period of time, you know, for for normal life, then yeah, I, I would definitely uh, do a complete tear out of all the interior alloy and the refractory and re-brick it and put all new alloy in. And now, uh, what about the steel case? When do you find uh, that the, the steel case is uh, it, not in the best shape or it can be bended or it can be rusted or have a very thin wall? Do you patch the equipment? It depends on how severe the damage is to the case and if, if You've had severe uh, 
ex exposure from the heat. Say, uh, say you have a refractory failure where you're getting the uh, furnace furnace temperature straight back to the casing and it's starting to delaminate the, uh, the, the, the uh, structure, the um, plate steel, then you have to either cut that area out and replace it with new, or if it's, if it's completely bad, you know, just a whole new casing. By the time you, by the time you get in there and start cutting all this, all this plate steel out and, and structural to support it, it's, it's sometimes more cost effective just to uh, get rid of the existing casing and put a new casing in there. But when you get a new casing in there, you're like having like a brand piece of equipment. Exactly. Because it, it, it's, it's just the shell, right? Maybe yeah. some, uh, you and I have worked in, in, in projects that they just give you the shell and go like retrofit it. Yep. Okay. And uh, of course, the, there's some, uh, uh, you make time, you, you actually buy time because you don't have to uh, do all the mechanical design for the casing and structure, right? So. Uh, going retrofit against going brand new gets you a little more more, more of a quick delivery on the equipment. Would that be accurate to say? Ah, uh, yeah, that would be accurate. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, what's 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 a typical advantage or percentage of on, on delivery time be, be between brand new and, and retrofitting if you use the casing itself. I would say I would say probably probably fifty to seventy percent. Of, of the lead time of, of, of a new, uh, say, new furnace. Say it again, do you say 50? 50 to Five 70 zero? percent probably. Really? Yeah. Really, that much? And on cost, would that be pretty much the same or would we we're talking the same problem? Because if you're buying the shell and you remove the shell, it, you, you have to pay for everything, right? Yes. So on cost, will that be a similar percentage? Brand versus, uh, you know, and I'm putting you here on the spot. Sorry, Mark. Well, I mean, uh, uh, but uh, does it make more sense to to use your equipment and retrofitting than buying brand new? If you have the budget, I believe everybody would like to buy brand new because you designed the equipment to your operation. But if you got the equipment from a bargain or from a, from a plant that closed down and had to be relocated, there are certain parts of the equipment that were not designed, tailor-made to your workflow on your operation. But that can be retrofitted for that operation though. Oh God, you, you're a great salesman. Yes. Yeah. Now uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, uh, what do you want to talk first? Uh, combustion or controllers? Well, let's talk uh, combustion. Combustion, okay. So we talk about casing, we talk about alloy, uh, we talk about the insulation, right? Now combustion, there are burners out there that are 50 years old uh, and still functional, right? Right. Uh, uh, but how do you retrofit those? How do you retrofit combustion trains with very old valves, with very old regulators, but they're still functional with, uh, uh, with uh, the maximum valve uh, and, and with all standards. I remember uh, back in the days, there were some mercoids that had uh, mercury in those and then those got banned and they had to be replaced by another switch. So what's the approach on, on the combustion system? Well, like you said, I mean, all those old switches that used to be the old mercury, mercury filled switches, those are all obsolete and those are banned now. So. That's 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 one big issue that that I address in, in the retrofits and relocations is that any any of those uh, switches have to be removed from the equipment and, and disposed of in a, in a proper manner. Um, the new combustion systems are you know they're low knox, a lot of, a lot of low knox emissions burners out there now. Uh, recuperation is a big thing. So the controls, you know, all the controls on them are, are state of the art these days too. So everything is electronic. Everything's electronic, yes. It is electronic and, and they have to be uh, uh, connected to the main cabinet, right? Right. Well, uh, and the ones that uh, they're a little more obsolete, they're, they're more mechanic, they were more mechanic. Yes. Okay. So 
would you also recommend to change all the burners and all the, all the all the switches and all the valves? What do you leave then if it's a, on a combustion system when when you're retrofitting? I mean, what, what's only the piping, the black pipe? Yeah, that all has to be replaced too. Probably that has to be replaced too as well. If you if you're changing everything out, if you're going from the uh, from the uh, gas train all the way back up to the burner, yeah. Then but there are parts that can be uh, remain like uh, the uh, air pipe, right? Yeah. You're going yeah, to still blow air. Yeah. And sometimes the the combustion air blowers are left, are, are left the same, right? Yes. If they work. If they work, yeah. Like like uh, one thing, if, if you're relocating equipment from one plant to another or another, another country, and I've run into this in the past, is uh, different elevations. We moved equipment from here in the states down to Mexico, right? The higher elevation, so the combustion air blower had to be upgraded for that higher uh, operational elevation in Mexico. So that's because that's of the thing. because of the lack of oxygen at higher elevations, right? Yes. Yeah. Something happened, uh, and so when we're talking about combustion system uh, on on a big retrofit and a, a big company like AFC Holcroft, do the do you get uh, the drawings from the previous furnace, or uh, you have in your database? But you do you do you have to re-engineer all the combustion system with the new parts, with the new burners, and and you just get a new print and and actually uh, retrofit the furnace according to that print, or how how do you do that? Yeah, we we have we're a large family of all the different furnace furnace companies, the OEMs. That, uh, AF, that are under the AFC Holcroft blanket. And we have a lot of all those old drawings are all hand drawings from back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And we can update them with uh, the, the current uh, AutoCAD style drawings now. And with then, then they're saved electronically. And then they're also updated to, you know, the current standards, you know, what, what, uh, what the new, burners are, what the new control systems are, and so on. And I believe this is very valuable to the customer uh, because when the furnaces are pretty old and you ask, uh, and there's a, let's say there's a combustion issue, right? Uh, the first thing you want to ask is like, hey, give me your combustion drawing so I can track uh, uh, where the issue is, right? right? And most of the time they're they're not updated because they, they, they did something uh, uh, beforehand or they didn't update the drawing or, or something. But if, if the customer has uh, the drawing updated, uh, there will be so much less pain on, on, on finding the failure. So I believe this is why it's, why it's important to have a combustion drawing updated. Yeah, and, but and, and, and at hand, I mean, because I just say, all the drawings were uh, handmade in the past from all furnaces. And now uh, it's very easy to just to send a PDF or an email or something and just just track the track the issue there. I mean that that is nice if the customer does update the drawings, but I would say that never happens, Mark. Come on. It tell never me happens. Well, I say, I'll, I I'll, I'll give you a hundred bucks for every customer you tell me that has a uh, drawings updated. Yeah uh, well you won't be giving me much money then. <laughs> <laughs> How would that you give me a hundred bucks for each customer that they didn't update their drawings, right? Yes, for sure. Right. Okay. Now, uh, going back, well, I miss, uh, before going to controls, I, I miss mechanics, right? Because mechanics are also a big part of the game. Uh, so we, we, we cover insulation and then we cover com uh, combustion train. Let's talk about mechanics. So those uh, gearboxes, motors, uh, chains, sprockets, uh, what else, rollers, uh, they're a basic mechanical system, right? Uh, but uh, I mean, the mechanics don't don't change as much. They, they don't have that much uh, 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 ele updating, el 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 electronic updating as 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 the burners or, or the switches. So, do you need the same motors? Uh, do you have to buy a brand new gear motor if if only it's damaged? Or I mean, what what's the criteria? On, on updating the mechanical system uh, against uh, not updated in it, right? And, and I'm talking about critical components because you might have bearings, but I, I think that's a consumable. I mean, yeah. a, a bearing can go bad and you just do regular maintenance. But when you're talking about a gearbox, uh, maybe there are 
that is 30 years old, but it's still functional because it, it's been uh, properly maintained. Uh, do you do you do, do we do we take that away and and put brand new, or do we just leave the same? No, usually uh, on a on a rebuild retrofit, if, if the we make the assumption that that all the components are operational as they are, and so if if they're operational, then we then we'll just reuse them. But if we if we during the during the testing phase during the retrofit and the rebuild phase of it, if we find that we do have a faulty a bearing, a faulty a gearbox, a faulty drive motor, then we'll bring it to the customer's attention and then uh, replace you know have it replaced. And I believe this this uh, raises a a very hard conversation because the customer has a budget, right? But right. those are things that cannot be. Uh, plan up front. So how how the, the how, how is the discussion like they go like well we, we give you the pay the PO and we expect a fully retrofitted for this. But you tell the guys well but uh, we assumed by contract that all, all this was functional and these items are not and, and these items cost money and they have uh, some delivery time. So what 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 do you see or how do you handle those cases? And if we stand on the customer's shoes, uh, what the customer gets right and doesn't get right regarding those those items that uh, if, if the item is broken, missing, or non-functional, it should, should be quoted as separate. But you don't have a way to know it because the foreign is, it, it might not even have, a, it might not even be a sample. Correct. Usually what I do on, on my rebuild retrofit pro, uh, proposals that I, that I spell out is I spell pretty much everything that we're gonna replace in black and white in the proposal so that the customer has that. And then, then I address it as anything that is found during the dismantle or the rebuild or the commissioning phase that is, that is in need of replacement or rebuild I, I address that as a contract addition to the customer. And, and then we give them a, a, a expedited price to get that out and get the part replaced. Because that can compromise the delivery time of, of uh, people, well, not of, of running parts. Correct. So it's, 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 it's a song and dance that you have to do when hey, you rebuild. I believe that's system. a very hard conversation because customers expect that everything is gonna go functional. And by the nature, of these retrofits, many things are going to fail when you uh, hit the switch. Correct. And the only way you can find out what's going to fail is hit the switch, throw the mm -hmm. power to it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the big thing, controllers, right? So what what, what would be the, the oldest piece of equipment you ever retrofitted? Like the oldest? Oldest piece? Yeah, old, old, older than you. Uh, well, that, 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 that'd be going way back. <laughs> uh, I would say probably a, probably a seventies vintage. A famous vintage. Okay. So uh, tell us about that project without uh, compromising the customer. Uh, I, Carlos, I've done so many field rebuilds and retrofits. I, uh, I, you know, just, just the old controls, the old dial controls, uh, temperature right. controls and that, that, that were on there, you know, the old, uh, relay logic. You know, it's just the control systems on, on, on equipment, it's just amazing these days. It's, it's way above me now. You know, that's why we have our electrical engineering department that does that design portion of it. But there's a conception that old things last longer because they were not electronic. I mean, they were mechanical and uh, like computers, you know, uh, computers in the past, they didn't uh, broke as much. Well, maybe that's a misconception of mine. But uh, now the, 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 with the, the cell phones and things like that, you have to replace them like uh, every two years or something because they might broke or go bad. So well, uh, the technology is updated. Yeah, technology is updated. But, 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 but I mean, on, on heat treat, and I'm not talking about uh, an, an aerospace application or an automotive application, but if, if you use one uh, heat metal and, and, and quench it, right? Uh, you could do it to re relay logic, right? And yes. have you seen forces that are still running with this operation nowadays? Very few, very few. Very few. But there are, 
There are there are some some old some old timers still have some old ones. Yes. Right, because if you will maintain them, uh, they can keep running forever because the mechanics were so robust that uh, that they just keep running. And now uh, with uh, the controllers, everything has a computer. Uh, you know, with with a, a, a bad junction or maybe a, a short, you will burn the screen off, and you will have to buy a brand new screen. Yeah. So yeah. what, the old, what the, old, the old relay logic is a lot more you, uh, maintenance friendly as far as troubleshooting any it is. problems. You know, and and the guys that work on the on the on the furnaces in the plants, you know, the guys that've been there a while that understand it. You know, they can go right to that relay that that they know is, is going to probably cause the problem and and you know troubleshoot it just like that. They just yeah. put a jumper on it, right? Exactly. That, that, that's an FPA. Don't have jumpers on it. Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that never happens in this industry. Nobody oh, has jumpers. No, 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 nobody has jumpers. No, right? nobody. nobody and, does. And, and if you compare relay logic to uh, new controllers, if there's an issue with the controller configuration. Uh, uh, most of the time, you gotta you gotta ask for a technician specialized on the controller, uh, with the with the software, uh, and the laptop, and laptop, and 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 if it's uh, uh, Alan Bradley or Siemens and you name it, and and they do black magic because nobody understands it besides them. So exactly, right? That's why that's why that uh, computer stuff's all over my head these days. Right, I'm an well, old dog. But uh, how, how do you handle this transition? I mean, when when you have a, re a relay logic uh furnace right uh if they want to do a massive retrofit you gotta go well the control panel has to go yeah and, and 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 it has to go yes and you have to design a brand new uh control cabinet with electronics computers uh you name it yeah right and that control system has to be linked or wired to the existing combustion train, to the existing uh, flow meters, uh, to the mechanics, right? So explain us a little bit about this, uh, this stage of the project, we, because we have talked about uh, insulation, which is pretty much uh, teared down and installed back. But now we're, we're talking about a brand new uh, entire system for electronics. Well, I mean, you pretty much spelled it right out as far as if, if you're going to convert an old relay logic panel, you got it. You got to you got to uh, dismantle that panel, get it out of there, and and then a new a new panel is in, is uh, manufactured and installed, and then everything's wired in there and then tested and uh, uh, debugged and commissioned. So, but but all the, all the engineering has to be done from scratch. Yes, and and how do you how do you make sure that the electrical components or the computers actually talk to the combustion system or, or to the flow meters if uh, they weren't retrofitted? Well, that's that's the service tech that comes out with his little laptop and mm. does his, like you said, does his magic. Black magic, black, black magic, magic, especially. Yes. So now going back, and, and another good uh, question that I have for you, when does it make sense to retrofit the equipment at customer plant, or whether it makes sense to take the equipment out, send it to the to an OEM or to another shop, and then install it, uh, install it back. If it's a relocation, uh, you know, tear this up, put it in the new place, and do the retrofitting there, or uh, or taking it onto a whole another shop. Uh, what do you see there? Uh, what's faster, and uh, what's faster might not be the best. Right, right, and and because we we also have to to talk with big plants about industrial safety, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. in, industrial safety is very important. I mean, I I don't want to, uh, you know, it, it is a big deal because safety has to be always uh, first thing that come in hand. Uh, but sometimes the procedures that this big company have, uh, they slow down the the process of retrofitting. Yeah, usually when you're doing a retrofit on a plant floor, a customer's floor, it will take a lot, lot more time to do it, and that's an added expense that uh, you know that gets thrown into the cost. You know, so that that does jack the price up a little bit. The um, the safety, the environment, 
um, housekeeping. There, there's all sorts of uh, factors that that you, that has to be taken into account when you do a retrofit on, on a customer's floor, especially if it's a major retrofit. If it's a major retrofit, uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend doing it on, on a customer's floor because it's, it's going to interrupt your, your uh, production flow too, especially, you know, how most heat treat departments are all crammed into one, one area in a plant and there's, you know, they pack them in as tight as they can. And uh, it, it's just, it's it, it just not advantageous to do a, a major retrofit on, on a customer's floor. Also the ambient, right? I mean, there's going to be uh, flames and smokes and, you know, parts going through and and it's and just to finalize on on these retrofits. I I see furnaces that you have retrofitted, Mark, and they're from the 1970s. Uh, and at the end, they look like a brand new furnace. That's basically what they are. Yes, that's basically what they are, right? Uh, but uh, if, if you go, uh, you can really tell that that was a retrofit. But if, if you take a picture and you compare it to another furnace, it looks brand new. Yes. Now, uh, if, if you could tell us, just to find for technical conversation, what are the most common mistakes or misconceptions uh, on a retrofit project uh, that uh, you always uh, you always find, or what are the challenges that they keep repeating themselves on a project? Well, basically, probably the pricing. A, a customer when they, when, they, when they approach us to do a retrofit, they think they're going to get it done on for pennies on the dollar, you know. And there's there's a lot more to a retrofit than just uh, you know you're gonna throw fifty dollars at it and, and it's gonna be just like brand new. No, it's not gonna happen that way. You gotta you gotta go through the whole the whole system and especially if it's not up to current NFPA standards or their their local insurance safety standards, then you know that's that that's a big ticket item that that needs to be addressed by the customer. Uh, what about on, on, on utilities or uh, electrical power, natural gas, air, when, when you have a, a furnace that is not brand new, uh, it, the utility consumption is not specified, uh, but uh, is that a big deal when you relocate a furnace or you retrofit one, the utilities? No, we usually give them what what the uh, what what the flows we we need for natural gas or nitrogen or water compressed air. You know, we usually have that you know spelled out with with the equipment. So you know, it's up to the plant to you know provide those utilities to a location near where the heat treat department is, or where the new or the uh, rebuilt equipment or relocated equipment is going to be uh, placed in the plant. That's fantastic, Mark. Thanks for sharing that. So. We, we have learned a lot today about retrofittings, uh, retrofit versus brand new, you know, the, the, the aspects. And uh, I do appreciate this conversation, Mark. As I just said, you have a bunch of experience in, in, in this uh, area. You, how, how many furnaces do you think you have retrofitting in your time career? Just give me a number. In my time career, well, 50. 50? 50, 50 60. Well, when I, I, and I'm talking big ass pushers, right? So, yes. Yes. All, so, all different sizes, but uh, the, yeah, the, the big ones are the fun ones. The big ones are the fun ones, right? Yes. So I believe you got a, a bunch of that uh, white hair from uh, some stress of, of those projects, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You, you know some of the customers I've dealt with. In the oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> We've done that together uh, yeah, many yeah. times. Yeah. And you know, yeah, and, and it's been a very pleasant experience. and. and you do learn a lot on, on, on retrofits because many things goes wrong and, and you have to address that, uh, uh, you know, uh, very quickly, right? Yeah. So thanks for sharing that on, uh, on the retrofitting side, on the technical side. Now let's switch to uh, the, uh, the other part of the podcast, which it's called uh, Heat Treat Hacking Hack or Gadget. Is there a specific uh, hack or gadget that you use regularly? On, uh, on your work that you would like to share with the audience? Well, everybody asks me as far as what, what I would recommend as far as, far as uh, buying or, or retrofitting a, a used piece of equipment. And I always, I always use, say to them, I said, well, say you wanted to buy a car, a used car. Would you buy a, a used car off of a 16 to 18 year old boy that uh, is just driving the hell out of it? 
or would you buy one off of a, a 70, 80 year old granddad that uh, drives it only on Sundays to church, takes it in for regular maintenance and uh, has 10,000 miles on it and it's 30 years old. So it depends on depends on on how how the customer treats their equipment. If 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 the customer maintains their equipment, you know you get the longevity out of that equipment with with minimal downtime. But as we know, every every heat treat furnace is is run to max capacity when 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 the production demands are there and they're run past max capacity most of the time too, and. Production rules, so there's very little downtime for, for proper maintenance on, on equipment these days. Maybe now with the COVID, with, with things slowing down in the production world, you know, that, that it, there may be more time for the maintenance department to get in there. But the other issue is that the maintenance, the, these maintenance departments are losing a lot of, of the skilled trades that have worked on this equipment. Experience. Experience, yes. So that's when a customer needs to get in contact with the OEM, because we're, you know, we know the equipment, we can provide you on-site support as needed to help you get get that equipment back up and operational, or just maintenance issues with it too. I will leave uh, you skip the nail. I mean, it's uh, you you have to watch the furnace how it was operated under normal normal operation uh, variables or not, right? And there's a lot of people that just beat their, the crap out of the equipment because they just want to produce, produce, produce. And if they don't well maintain it, the furnace is going to collapse as we just uh, took at the beginning of the podcast, right? So yeah. thanks. I mean, I, 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 take a, I take a lot from that, uh, from, from, from that hack, you know. Uh, now, uh, just to conclude our, our, uh, our podcast today, Mark, uh, you uh, have been working on this industry since the 70s. You say late 70s, right? Yes. Right. With, with a fine art degree, right? With a fine so, art degree. so you you do you do not retrofit furnaces. You do art, right? On yeah. furnaces, right? Yes. Yeah. That's, right. that's what I that's what I liked about back in the seventies. Uh, we used to sit behind a big drafting board and do do uh, do all the engineering drawings, and I I, I took a special uh, special pleasure in, in in the drawings that I, I um, spit out for the for the furnace okay. companies that I worked for. I. I I, I bet. I mean, you're, because you're a very passionate man about what you do, right? Yeah. And uh, I believe you you actually found art retrofitting furnaces, which when you see, uh, uh, you know, uh, an old casing with, uh, you know, this, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, black refractory, and then you see the line at the end of the project, you go like, whoa, this is a piece of art, right? So I believe you do that. So, but, but going back to my question, and, and, and this is the final question for the show. Uh, you've been in the industry for a, uh, a long time. Uh, I believe you, you are an expert in what you do. Uh, you have seen many applications. You've been in many projects. You have met a lot of people, uh, different furnaces, different problems. And, and, and your career has been super successful because I have worked with you personally. And uh, I respect you a lot, Mark. I, I just want to say that. And uh, 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 but as you used to express it, uh, the the experienced people is retiring or leaving the industry, uh, and this is a complex industry. It's a very technical industry. Uh, you cannot take a guy that knows basics mechanics and say, okay, I want you to retrofit this furnace, or basic insulation, or or, or basic combustion. They have to understand furnaces, right? Yes, yes they do. Uh, or, or, or a guy with a P, with a laptop or a, with PLC knowledge, they have to understand atmosphere, right? The, they have to understand the equipment itself. But and 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 the, the people with the experience that you have is, is leaving the industry because of of, of uh, you, you know of uh, the nature of life, of natural life, right? Uh, but what would you tell? Or what advice would you give to the new generation of heat treaters uh, that um, they they want to start on the maintenance department, on on, on they or they want to have a, or, or they want to get these projects for retrofitting plants? Or I mean, what would be an advice or a personal experience that you would like to share 
with the new generation of heat readers that you you wish someone would have, would have told you when you started your career? Well, I would recommend that any any new engineer graduating from from college or technical school or anything like that start doing the engineering work, but after after a short period of time, say six months or so, go and work in a shop, in a manufacturing shop, and and learn how how to cut, weld, lay brick, um, wire. And then after that, go out in the field and do the install of that equipment and deal with dealing with the customer, solving the field problems that come up every, every project that you have. And then after that, then you can go back to doing the design work in the, uh, at, at the facility at AFC Holcroft or wherever the OEM is. But I mean, any, any, any valuable experience you're going to learn, you're going to, you need to diversify yourself and, and learn all aspects of the business. That's, that's what that Heather uh, Falcone said on, on that one podcast. And I totally agree with her that, you know, with a smaller company, you have a lot more opportunity to move around to different departments and, and, uh, find what is your, what, what's your area of expertise and, and what you really like to do. And that's a great advice. And uh, I, I do try uh, to tell the guys that they have to go out of the field. I mean, everybody wants to sit on a computer and sit down all day long, send emails back and forth, trying to decipher problems, but go to the shop, uh, go and, and see where the jam is on the furnace. Uh, to try, try to think uh, why this happened, how can we solve it and how can we prevent it in the future? Right. If, you're, if you're doing the same work, right? So, yeah, that was... Uh, uh, and I always, and I, always, I always say that don't ever say that you can't solve a problem because a problem can be solved one way or the other, you know? So don't ever say or don't, don't ever give up because there's always a solution. Thank you so much, Mark. Mark, uh, I actually uh, learned a lot and I actually... Uh, enjoy the, a bunch or, or conversation. I wish to see you soon. Uh, you know, uh, you and I have uh, worked together for many, many years, but this uh, travel restrictions has uh, uh, been terrible for uh, uh, socializing. But you know, uh, guys, Mark's a great guy. Uh, one of the, uh, the guys with most experience on the furniture retrofitting industry. Uh, Mark, it was uh, great speaking to you. Thanks for the time. Uh, And uh, I just would like to remind you that we're uploading uh, a weekly podcast. We're on LinkedIn, we're YouTube, uh, Spotify, if, if you, you want to work out or hear uh, the podcast uh, while you're driving. Uh, this is the Hitred Podcast, and this was Mark Johnston.